What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're gonna to be going over adding particle effects, VFX to our game. So as we hit objects such as walls, we will be able to see where they hit. These are a little bit dramatic right now, as you can tell, but this is just an example. We also wanna be able to hit our opponents and spawn particle effects. And I even added different particle effects depending on where we hit. So legs and body, the regular colliders are all hitting for the standard same particle effect but hitting the head is actually spawning a different particle effect. So I'm spawning a headshot effect, essentially. Projectiles can also go through one another right now and have some collateral damage, which can be changed later, but that is due to the overlap effect that we have, allowing us to actually get that. All right. So you'll be able to play around with this, change these to whatever effects you want, as well as change what things actually spawn effects and which others don't. So if you want certain objects to spawn a default effect or a specific effect, or if you want one to spawn none at all. So before we actually get started today, I'll link you to this icon in the top right corner, which is the entire playlist of the first person shooter tutorial series. We will be building off a lot of that logic in today's episode. So if you haven't checked that out and you wanna follow along, it may be beneficial. Alternatively, if you don't want to check out the entire series, there is one episode you will want to follow, and that is the episode where we started firing bullets out of the muzzle of our weapon, because we are going to be building off of that logic today specifically, and you will want to check that out to get caught up on how we did that. All right. And so today we're going to start with our actual ammo, because that is what is going to be firing that's where we're going to be doing our collision although we are going to have to change the collision settings for a lot of objects to actually interact with each other so if we go to base ammo bp we have this generic class that is the parent for all of the collision logic for our ammo right now all of our ammo effects are going to be the same no matter what type we're using however it's very simple to actually change what effect plays based on the type of ammo class that we have. When we get into more differences between ammo types such as damage, we'll cover the different effects as well. For now, I'm doing everything in base ammo BP. And so essentially, I wanna override the logic that was happening in the base enemy BP before. So in base enemy BP, we have two colliders on each enemy. So we have a collision box, which is the standard box. If ammo hits this, then we know that we're going to deal damage to this enemy. Otherwise, we have a weak point hurt box where if this gets hit by the ammo or the bullet or the projectile, whatever it may be, then we can do like a critical hit worth of damage. We can do extra damage. What we were using those for is we were checking to see if it was hit with the base projectile, the base ammo that was shot out of a weapon. And if it was, we were taking damage and we were destroying the actor. I've disabled this logic now. You can see it's not connected because we're going to do it on the ammo itself. Now, for the base weapon, this is all done through a raycast. And then if the raycast hits this specific type of object, we take damage. And so I figured we should do the same thing with the ammo. The enemy really shouldn't be the one to determine what happens if they're hit by this. While we can change logic depending on the enemy, so say we have an enemy with multiple forms, they take damage, they might want to change into another form, something like that. The enemy can define that logic, they can determine what happens at that point. But for standard collisions, we probably don't want every enemy to handle that because the bullet, the projectile, has to handle collisions anyway. So at that point, we can just determine what actor we actually hit or what component we hit on that actor and then determine the logic that we want to do from there. So since we are looking at base ammo and base enemy, I've set up default logic that will work for everyone. Doesn't mean we can't add more in the future. You can actually delete the two on component begin overlap events, one for the collision box and one for the weak point hurt box on the base enemy BP, as neither of them will be needed after this. So I'm gonna get rid of them. And I'm gonna move this logic up. At this point, we will have only the begin play and the event die BP logic set up for the base enemy BP. 
while we're in base enemy BP, I do want to check out the collision logic real quick. So if we take a look at our class defaults, we can go to each of the colliders. Remember, these are just essentially static mesh components that I've added. They could be box collision. They can be whatever you want, depending on if you need to visualize them or not. Right now, I'm not visualizing them. I just have them in place. And just to show you, do you have my specific type of zombies? And so I can go in here if I want, open the full blueprint, go to the viewport, and I can modify where the collision box and the weak point hurt box actually are. If I were to make them visible, then you can see what they actually look like on each character. You can leave them here if you'd like and keep them hidden in game. And so when I play as this, you won't see them in the game, but you can see them in the editor and on the blueprint itself. That's up to you if you want to leave that. But we set this up in a previous episode where we were dealing with different types of hurt boxes. I was just showing you that that is where we set that logic up. And so in the base enemy BP, we have these two colliders and we want to change their collision presets to make sure that they account for everything we're going to need when they're collided with live rounds of ammo. So going to the collision box, which is again, not the, the weak point box, I go down to my collision and I have to make sure some things are set up. So we do want to make sure they generate overlap events, which it should have already been doing. The collision presets themselves, it was either default or overlap all before, depending on what you wanted. You could also do block all if you're using more physics based collisions. <laughs> I made it custom now and had everything overlap all. Visibility is block all by default when I switch it to custom because I have the collision enabled as query only. I'm not dealing with any advanced physics right now, like bouncing or uh, going through a certain type of object. So I'm just doing query only to save on performance. I've set the object type to be static in this case for this collision box, but this also doesn't matter right now because we're not going to check for that specifically. We're going to check against these components if the object that we hit determines if we determine that it is an enemy. And that's what mine looks like. And then same for the headshot. So it's not super important you change anything here today. It, it might be what you've already had, depending on your settings from the previous episodes. So don't worry too much about that. Just make sure that the overlap is enabled and that we can actually overlap with a projectile. That's the most important for now, that the projectile should be on overlap, not block. For each of those tag mesh components. All right, now with that in mind, we should go to our base weapon BP and do something as well, because we don't want the weapon to collide with a projectile. At least if we do, we don't want it to spawn the same sort of effect. And since we are shooting the projectile out of our weapon, we definitely don't want it to collide with the weapon. We could still allow it to collide with other weapons and cause an effect and even damage the player if you want, if you want to kind of consider it an extension of the player just by checking our specific weapon against the bullet. But I did not do that for now. All I've done is disabled the overlap between projectile and our base weapon BP. So you can see my all my settings here for my base weapon BP. I've changed it to something other than world static. And I'll explain this later when we get to that part of the episode. But you have generate overlap events, which we want. We have query only, which we want. And then this just needs to be off of world static for now. And then the projectile should be block. And with that in place, when we actually shoot our projectile out of our weapon, it will not collide with our weapon. We'll ignore that entirely. All right. And now we're actually going to be getting into the main content for today now that we have that set up. So we're going to go to our base ammo BP, like I mentioned at the start of this episode. And let's take a look at our collision presets on here as well. So I have generate overlap events set to true on my static mesh of my base ammo BP. I have the collision set to custom. 
query only. And I've made the type projectile. You could create a custom type if you are familiar with that. We've done it in our Super Smash Brothers platform fighter tutorial series and in a few other places. It's actually pretty simple and I will be covering it later in this series as well. But for now, projectile will fit if you don't have a custom one. Uh, then I have it where everything is overlap except for projectile. Actually isn't required. You could leave that overlap as well. But this is just for the future. If bullets hit each other, I'm going to have like a block effect. We can take a look at the event graph of this base ammo BP. And so it might look like a lot. It's actually not. And it can be made simpler the more advanced that we get because we can do things like use switch statements and enums for what type of collision it is. Right now, I only have three types of collision. So I did it all through branches. But you'll see very quickly that this becomes a lot of additional work if we're going to do simple branches because we have to check very specific things. Whereas if we determine the type of collision beforehand, we could do a lot more with less nodes. So as you get more and more complicated, you're going to see we're going to want something like a switch statement in here, which again, we will be covering. In the event graph, the first thing we want to do, we did not have any actual logic in our base MOBP to this date. So you might have your begin play, your tick, your on actor overlap nodes that are just kind of grayed out here, ready for you to fill out. I got rid of all of them. Instead, I'm going to do a overlap specifically on the static mesh component. Because if we have other things related to our ammo that ends up colliding, so say our bullet collides with something and it's not on the static mesh. In this case, I only care about the static mesh field or if I have a certain like collision collider on our bullet. Right now I don't, so I'm using the static mesh. So if you click on it, you can scroll down. You can click on component begin overlap here and add this node. So right now we're using on component begin overlap for our collisions. This is mainly because we can have an, a component that hits multiple objects. So we shoot our bullet, say it hits both the headshot collider and the body collider. We may want to use one over the other. Overlap can be useful for that sort of thing. Now we're actually going to want to use blocking in the near future for a lot of this, like for when we shoot walls and stuff. However, that is going to be a little bit different in terms of behavior, and I didn't want to confuse, make this episode confusing with the VFX specifically. So we do handle this sort of behavior down here. This is the wall behavior. However, this will most likely change to a blocking behavior in the future, so be aware of that. We can definitely use on component hit as well, that event right here. We will have to change a few collision presets in the ammo itself to make that work, but we'll cover that when we get to those sort of blocking collisions. For now, this does the job. It is just a little bit strange for blocking collisions that we handle at the end. This top part here is still perfectly valid and will be pretty useful for things like going through enemies and collateral damage if you want to include that. All right, so on component begin overlap has a bunch of parameters that you can actually grab and use to determine what we collided with, what we overlapped with. And so the first thing we want to do is grab the actor that we collided with and cast it to the type that we care about. So the main thing I want to see is if we collide with an enemy or not. If we collide with an enemy, we know that we want to deal damage to the opponent and we want to determine if it was a headshot collision or a weak point collision or just a standard collision. If the cast fails, that means we did not collide with an enemy and we can go and do other logic. I'll get into that after we're done the enemy logic. So say the cast succeeds, that's the top node here. That means we collide with an enemy. Now we have to determine what component we actually collided with. So we have two components, as I mentioned, our collision box and our weak point hurt box. So we can grab these from our base enemy BP object. So we just type git collision box and scroll all the way down to the bottom. It'll be under default here. Or you can type get weak point hurt box right here. Grab both of them. And we're just going to do two comparisons. We want to check against the other component here. 
so we check the overall actor to determine if it is the actor we wanted. Once we know it is the actor we want, we can check more specific collisions, such as our collision or our weak point. So at this point, we want to check the other component to see the component that we collide with and check if it's equal to either of these. If it's equal to the collision box, which you can check by doing equal equal, and then just passing another component, then we're going to do our standard collision logic and effect. If this is false, it doesn't mean that we haven't collided with the weak point hurt box. So we want to check that one specifically. So false, and we want to check weak point hurt box equal equal other component. If we collide with that one, we want to go ahead and do our headshot specific logic. So they have two different effects, which I'll show you the effects in a minute. And then they also do different damage. I took the same default damages I used from base enemy VP that we removed at the start of this episode. So standard collision against body, legs, whatever is 0 0.1. And a more advanced collision against the headshot is 0 0.3. Worth noting while we're here, there is a special type of like painting we can do on our character skeleton, which allows us to actually determine where we hit them based on values we set. So it, we don't have to use colliders. We can actually check the collision against where the painting on the, the mesh is. And that'll make it really nice if you have a bunch of different colliders. Say you want the feet to do like 0 0.15, the legs to do 0 0.3, uh, headshot to do 0 0.5, body to do 0 0.4, whatever. If you have all these different values, you don't want to have colliders on all of them necessarily. We have a more advanced method we can use for that type of collision. And I'll definitely be showing that off later in the series. But if you only have like two types of collision, just a standard and a, and a critical, this method works fine. You're only handling it for two cases, not like 10, 15, 20, however many. Anyway, if either of these collisions are true, we want to do something called spawn emitter at location. So literally spawn emitter at location. And we have to pass it a location. We can pass it a rotation of scale as well. And we pick the emitter that we want to use. Now I have a default, I have a pack in here. And this is called the Infinity Blade Effects Pack that's on the Epic Marketplace. So it's okay if you don't have this. These are just random ones that I have. If you don't have it, it's okay. You can either make your own or download them or buy them from somewhere. If you want to make your own, you hit add. You go to FX. And then in UE5, you have the Niagara system. So you can make a Niagara emitter or a Niagara system to combine a bunch of particle systems. Now, I haven't done any of that yet, so I'm not going to be covering that in today's episode. But you can look up other tutorials, other guidance, the actual documentation, figure out how to do that if you don't have any available to you. You can make a temporary one now just to set the system up and of course make it look better later. But I've picked three different effects. I have P troll impact, P troll death impact. So death impact is the headshot. The standard impact is a hit. And then I have another effect down here called P troll swinging or swing impact that I'll show you in a little bit. And these emitters are gonna be spawned at the location we choose. I typically use the standard get actor location method here because this is the get actor location of self is the base ammo BP. So wherever this is and wherever this collision is caught, this overlap collision is caught, we're going to spawn the collision there. That's usually good enough for this stage in the series. We can get more advanced into exactly where we collide to, to display that effect. But honestly, right now I haven't modified these effects and made them the right size or even show up at the right rotation because these are just standard effects that I have and I'm using at this point in the code. So for now, I'm just using the standard get actor location of this base ammo BP, passing into location, left everything else default. Then, I want to do any other logic that I want when a collision with an enemy at this hurt box occurs. So you see I have another reroute node that goes through here and I call take damage on each enemy. It's important to note, if I want to take damage on each of these enemies, I could destroy the ammo if I wanted to at this point. That would stop collateral 
damage. So right now, if I shoot through an opponent, I can hit all of them, which is pretty cool. It's a cool effect, but you might not want that on all your weapons. In fact, you'll probably want it for some and not others, such as snipers might be able to give collaterals. After a collision, if I destroy the actor, then we'll get rid of the collateral damage. Say I line this up again. It only hit the first one. So that's up to you how you want to set that up. I'm going to actually disable collateral damage for now because all of our weapons now, I don't believe any of them should have it. But we'll make it a setting later where we can determine if we want to perform collateral damage with that weapon. And then we'll have some branching logic. It'll be super simple. Now let's go to another case. So if we did not collide with an enemy as the actor, we know that the cast failed, so we can go and determine what other object we collide with and potentially spawn an effect there as well. So this is what I keep saying would probably be better as a blocking collision because this isn't really an overlap, right? This is our mesh. This is a wall. We really just want to destroy it as soon as collision occurs. But right now, since we have overlap in place, we're just going to use it and make it work, and I can show you the differences between blocking later. So to make an overlap work on a standard object, this isn't a blueprint that I created. This is a standard wall object that just exists within Unreal, right? This is just like a static mesh that exists, okay? What you can do if you wanna have logic in the environment to collide with overlapping objects is you can go around, select all the objects that you want to be able to collide with. So I'm grabbing things like the bench, the cubes, these little walls that stick out and the actual boundary walls as well. Uh, make sure you select the ground too if you want that. I'm not selecting other objects like my damage colliders or my health pickups or the weapons. And I'm gonna go down and I'm gonna look at my class details. I'm gonna make sure generate overlap events is clicked. If generate overlap events is clicked, then with our other logic that we set up earlier, we will be able to make this work without changing anything else about them. I would recommend that you change their collision presets to default as this will stop it from having to interact with other logic. Like say if we set the pawn, which doesn't even make sense in this case, but say we set the wall to pawn, then our collision presets on our other objects would have to make sure that they accounted for the pawn collision response. So it's better if you just set it to default because then it will go to things like world static, world dynamic, depending on the type of object that it is. And then it can do very simple collision to check against those to see if we overlapped or blocked. Basically, it won't really be affected so much by our standard collision presets that we have because they're default. And so they just handle it however they see fit best for that object which is perfectly fine for us. Now, there are a few cases where we had something called physics actors right here. These cubes are actually physics actor by default. And what they are is they are objects that we can actually bump into them, move them around. And so they are not considered just world static or world dynamic. For them to have collision, we have to make sure we account for physics actor and standard world static like these walls are all right so if the cast fails and we don't hit an enemy we check down here we grab our other component and we type get collision object type you can do it on the mesh or just the collision object type if you drag off of the other component right here and you'll get this node this returns the type of object that this object that we collide with is and so the object type is again this right here like how we set our ammo to be projectile and you can also set world static world dynamic all these things we set the object type here and then we can grab it and compare it to see if we should do certain things based off of it so i drag off of the return value type equal 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 enum and then i select the type i want so I have two of them. I'm accounting for world static and physics body. I'm doing an or statement on them. 
or Boolean. Then I drag that result into the branch. And if it's true that it hit either one of these, we're going to spawn this other type of emitter, which is, again, my troll swing impact at the bullet's location. All right. Let's just go ahead and take a look at all those effects real quick because I like to show you what they look like. So here's troll impact. This is what it looks like in editor. And you can tell that's the one that is colliding with the standard collision box on the enemy. So if I shoot an enemy in the chest, for example, not the head, you see they have that effect. Okay. We also have the troll, I believe it's death impact. This is the headshot. And so if I land a headshot on an opponent, you can see that it does that effect as well. Lastly, we have the troll swing impact. All right. And one last time, if we play and we hit now another object like the ground, we get that impact as well. So there's all the effects, and you can see them working in action. You can see the collision is not perfect because we're using overlap and not block. So sometimes it kind of appears inside of the wall. This is why I said blocking could be better for a lot of the static objects like this. That's why we will want to update it in the future. Specifically for things we don't want our ammo and our bullets to pass through. Quick note, the reason we use world static and physics body was because of those objects we set up in the scene. That is also why I wanted weapon base weapon BP to not use world static. Because otherwise, if you left the skeletal mesh as world static, then what could happen is I could actually come in here, and depending on the camera, depending on the object I have, I could trigger the effect on the weapon itself, and we don't want to do that. Now, one solution is to simply check against if we are colliding with an object that owns the the bullet or you know specifically a weapon or whatever but if we just change the collision type then we ignore this altogether and honestly we can make it a different type than world static anyway because we'll probably have a weapon type that we custom make but for now just changing it off of world static works now there is one final thing we can do here and that is take a look at our create ray trace function in our base weapon bp because we have some weapons that are hit scan so in our, if we use our assault rifle right now, right here, say I pick this up and I shoot an opponent, we get no hit effect. We have that, that line for debugging purposes, but we have no actual hit effect coming off for VFX. That is because this is a hit scan weapon and it's not using real ammo. So we need to make sure we go into our create ray trace function in our base weapon BP, where we did our hit scan. And right in front of where we do our take damage, we can match the logic that we have for the base ammo BP. So we can actually do this real quick. Bring this over. And I'll bring this reroute node over as well. Since we don't need that base enemy BP reroute node. I'll do something like this probably. And what we want to do is just spawn our emitter here. In this case, we just have if it's equal to weak point hurt box, do extra damage. So if it is equal to the weak point hurt box, we want to use the same emitter that is spawned when the collision with the ammo is the weak point hurt box, which is the bottom method here. So we can use the spawn emitter at location, pass it into the top here. All right? And I'm going to drag this down so it's below it we want to spawn emitter at location of the other one if this is false this is the standard collision let's uh, straighten this out and so we have to change our emitter to troll impact okay and we're pretty much good but we do need to add a location so that it shows up in the right spot as well now to do that, 
this is a little bit different than how we did it on the ammo BP because we actually have a location of the hit that is tracked from the hit result. So we can actually use this location. You can just pass it in if you like. Something simple like this, pass it into both locations. And now when we pick up a hit scan weapon, we can use it and spawn the appropriate effect. For the ground, it's a little bit different. We were checking to see if we hit a base enemy BP. You could do the same thing you did in the base ammo BP, like I keep mentioning. So now if we copy all of our logic down here and go into our create ray trace function again, I can paste the logic under it. And if the cast to our specific enemy type fails, then I want to kind of pull this all out and do this, something similar to that. And that looks pretty good. So uh, we want to make sure we grab the hit component and pass this in. See hit component should go into the get collision object type. And let's bring this out a little bit more. And then we don't want to use get actor location, but instead we want to use our hit location yet again. So the same location that we use for these guys. This actually looks a little bit ugly, so I think I'm going to pass the location down here instead of passing it in from up there. Okay, something like that. It's still a little bit ugly, but this is just quick on the spot. You can make it look nicer. And now let's do the final test. If we have our hit scan weapon, you see we can actually hit objects and have it interact in the scene around us as well. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. And I really appreciate it. I want to give a huge shout out to my Patreon members and YouTube membership subscribers. Thank you guys for everything you've done to continue to show me support. Really grateful. And I really love working on these games week after week if you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials feel free to join the discord community be happy to get you sorted and fixed up so you can continue working on the series without issues and anyway guys like i said that's all i got so thank you so much for watching i'm sean the bro and i'll see you in the next one goodbye guys